As services have changed uh, this morning, over the course of the next couple of weeks, we're going to continue to uh, cooperate with uh, the request from various levels to regarding gatherings. So we'll be streaming our services again, our service in the morning again next week, and uh, then we will simply sort of take it week by week. But please, if everybody could remember just to tech check the electronic communications, we'll be communicating via email uh, to those who perhaps are not uh, connected with a Facebook account or can't get on the website. But check our electronic communications and we'll just keep you up to date. And uh, when it comes to giving, uh, we'll be communicating via electronic communications as to how that you can do that over the course of the next number of weeks. Thank you for leading us in prayer. And we're going to continue to pray for wisdom for all of our elected officials, for those that are working within the health department. But we thank God that uh, we are rock solid on a firm foundation. So this morning I want to share a message that I've entitled, The Touch of the Master's Hand. And, uh, and then at the conclusion, the worship team will come up for one last number. But this morning, as I said, my message is entitled, The Touch of the Master's Hand. About 6,000 years ago, ago, God sculpted a world that was amazingly beautiful. I mean, at the conclusion, He created the very, the very zenith of His creation, which was humanity. And in this human body, He's given us the ability to appreciate so many different things. He's given us five senses. Uh, he's given us the sense of sight. Hearing, smell, touch, and taste. Although with age, some of those begin to dim a little bit. But we're so thankful for an incredible world. And our world is filled with so many amazing things to appreciate with our senses. I mean, the world has stunning panoramas, visual. I mean, when it comes to sight, the world has incredible panoramas, uh, oceanscapes that uh, are, are, are absolutely breathtaking. Uh, you know, the northern lights, the spectacular fall colors that we can enjoy. I mean, it's way beyond fall, but uh, we, have, uh, so we have two seasons within the Maritimes. We have winter, and then we have four months of hard sledding. Uh, but then after those four months of hard sledding, we have a little bit of beautiful color to fill our, our uh, panoramas. We have amazing things to hear. I love to walk down by the ocean and listening to the waves on the seashore. It is just amazing. I love to take the high end trail. And, and I was told by somebody that there was this amazing trail and I don't know how many times I've just gone down to listen to the ocean side. I mean, in the morning to wake up, I just like to keep my eyes closed for a few minutes and listen to the birds. Well, it's, yeah, they have the crows too, they're out my garbage. <laughs> But I tell you, it's nice to be able to hear the birds around us. And uh, I have an appreciation for great music as well. I mean, we've got some great music, symphonic music within Nova Scotia. And then, of course, when it comes to the, 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 uh, the sense of smell, I love, my, my wife, she loves candles, okay? Uh, we buy our share when it comes to Christmas time in particular, but the scent of a candle, a fir tree. Now, of course, we've had a artificial for quite some time, but you can buy those, uh, you know, aroma things that you can stick into the uh, electrical plug, and then it'll smell like your room is filled with a fir tree. But uh, other things that we appreciate, I mean, lilacs in the spring, my wife's favorite, uh, favorite flower, and I always would have to cut some and put them in a, I, I planted them. Uh, lilacs just for her. Or perhaps a campfire. Now as I'm talking, some of you are sitting there and you can smell these things. Can't you smell the smoke of a fire? Or perhaps fresh cut hay? Any of uh, you ever done any uh, haying? I used to, whenever I had the opportunity, church as a pastor, go out and give a whole day to hay. Ah, the aroma, the beauty of the world that we've uh, been blessed with. And then of course the sense of touch. And when I think of that, I think, of course, of family. Because is there anything any more beautiful than to take and hold a little one close to you? I tell you, 
You enjoy it when you have your own, and then you enjoy it even more, I think, when you have your grandchildren. But the sense of touch, it's a wonderful world. You know, actually, um, <laughs> there are Louis Armstrong, some of you remember the name, Louis Armstrong sings a song, it wasn't his own, but he sings a song called It's a Wonderful World. <laughs> And I tell you, I know very well that bringing that to my wife's attention, it's her favorite song. We're going to hear that probably three or four times before the end of the day. But it is a wonderful world that God has given us. It satisfies our senses, okay? But you know, even though it's a beautiful world, we've certainly discovered over the course of the last few weeks that it is not a perfect world as it once was. It's devolved. And although it's a beautiful world as far as senses, I've discovered that the world in which I live, it's paradoxical today. It's a beautiful world, and yet, in this beautiful world, there are so many empty hearts. Now, sadly, there's so much of our world that lives uh, through life, chasing some elusive dream that can bring satisfaction into their lives. They pour their lives into this world, and they can see and hear and enjoy all of these incredible things, but they're never ever totally and completely satisfied. At the end of the most amazing day, the most amazing outing, uh, at the conclusion of day, there's this sense of, well, I, something is missing. You know, from a young age, our world is given a certain value system that teaches us that physical beauty, strength, a sharp mind, and other such measurables, you know, if you've got the right measurables, that ultimately it will bring some type of satisfaction. And yet, I discovered that even though we offer all sorts of opportunities, and I did it too for my children, and societies and prone to offer all sorts of incredible opportunities in our world to expand people's horizons, so we give our kids swimming lessons and we give them music lessons, and we give them art, and we give them gymnastics, and we give them anything and everything that uh, we have the capability of giving them. They're introduced to the world of competitive sport. They enjoy the world of entertainment and music. They, we expand their social horizons, and yet after having done all of that, this is a generation I'm not just talking about a generation, but I'm talking about all of the collective generations. It's a generation that ultimately feels such a sense of dissatisfaction. You see, the problem is, is that we bought into a value system that has been taught to us and perpetrated by uh, media, but we fail to even see that even amongst the heroes that we admire, celebrities and those who have seemingly uh, achieved it all, accumulated it all, done it all, experienced it all with all of their senses, and yet what we don't realize is that even our heroes have clay feet and empty hearts. And so if we simply teach them to value the same dreams, uh, the fact of the matter is that if we just give them the opportunity and we think that making the cut on the next team or perhaps having the grades high enough to, and that's good, have high grades, it's great to make the team. But you can make the cut and you can have the grades, but ultimately success isn't met. Success and satisfaction is not measured by making the cut in those areas. Fact is this, what we've discovered is that even those who achieved their dreams and their goals in life, even when they've reached the summit of what seems to be what they desire, when they reach the summit, often what happens is that they, they discover that at that summit, all they hear is the, it's, it's empty, all they hear is the windswept noise of their own fears and doubts. Uh, I did some, actually, re some research over the course of the last uh, number of weeks, and this is what I've discovered. Hey, by the way, before I say this, have you noticed the, when I was growing up, uh, there was the tabloid industry, there was, there was all of these magazines in the supermarket, and as you watched by, the supermarket tabloids, they make their dollars on the misery and ruin of well-known lives. 
and of course it may not be in the in the it may not be in the supermarkets, but now it's online tabloids. But what we realize is that even those who have really seemingly made it in life, their worlds are not as perfect as we would imagine. They're still struggling. And the fact is this is that I read a a, a, a disturbing statistic that in one particular entertainment industry, that the average life expectancy of people within that industry was 25 years younger than the normal life expectancy. I, I saw another statistic that came from just the last year. There was a commissioner of a major sports, uh, a major sports franchise, that is, for, for an entire uh, fortune, uh, uh, an entire uh, sports league. world, okay, a league. And uh, what I read is this, that that particular commissioner made this statement. He said, many of the league's players who have an average salary of seven million, that's the average, average salary of seven million dollars a year, he said this, many of the league's players who have an average salary of seven million dollars a year are truly unhappy. That is to say they have major health, mental health issues. And they, that particular league is not alone. The fact is, is that I have read statistics that across the board, elite athletes struggle with the same issues that you and I do. We all live in the same world. We are no different one from the other, no matter what we seem to have accomplished in life. On more than one occasion, I can remember setting in people's homes or talking late at night with individuals who, in my estimation, were amongst some of the most successful people that I knew in my community. And yet, what I realized after hours of conversation is it doesn't matter how high you climb on the corporate ladder, the view from the top is no better than the view from the first rung. I'm saying this morning, God, help us to see beyond what is temporal. Help us to see that which is invisible. Now, that sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? Help us to see what is invisible. Uh, not see with our physical eyes, okay? Sounds paradoxical, but we as a generation have perhaps at large failed to see what is most important and what can satisfy more than our senses. Uh, the scripture says that uh, Abraham uh, followed God because he saw what was invisible. That is to say he marched to a different drummer, he followed a different beat because he saw beyond what he could see with his physical senses. He knew that there was a God. And uh, that's what we're talking about. I believe our generation, if they're going to experience more than the the satisfaction of our sensual being that we really need to get back to exploring what exists within the spiritual realm. Now that's being done by both believers and unbelievers. Just because people uh, may not attend a church or may not call themselves by a specific religious name, there is a deep inner yearning and it's been even explored over the course of the last number of decades. Back in the decade between 2010 2017, there was a series called uh, Through the Wormhole. Any of you familiar with it? Yeah, Through the Wormhole, actually, it's very, very curious. Uh, it ran for seven years and explored matters of spirituality and what lies on the other side. Matters of death, matters of life, is there a God? Interestingly, individual who narrated and hosted that show played uh, God in uh, two major movies, uh, which were entitled Bruce Almighty and Evan Almighty, okay? Now the narrator of the series Through the Wormhole, he played God in that, but the curious thing is that God doesn't believe in God. <laughs> that sounds like an oxymoron. Well, it certainly it is, but the individual who both played in those movies and narrated Through the Wormhole did not believe in the existence of God. He said in an interview at one point, it was a segment in, through, in, in the series Through the Wormhole, the segment that was entitled, Did We Invent God? And this was his remark. He said, uh, he made it clear that his belief system did not support a creator, and he thought that we had invented God. So, 
I ask you this morning, some of you who have grown up in a, quote, Christian home, some of you who perhaps are, at this point, have been exploring matters of faith, you're not certain, what do you believe? I don't, I'm not looking for a trite God of the heaven, you know, I believe in God. The scripture, even if you're a Christian, the scripture says that we should actually not simply know, but we should be convinced to the point that we can actually give an answer to those who ask the reason for our faith. And uh, actually in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, it says this, But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. I, I like the fact that that uh, is added at the end. Uh, we are, are, are not, the, the Christian world, if we truly believe, we also need to, when we share our faith, we need to do it with care and love and respect. So if you're a believer, why do you believe? I'm going to give you three simple reasons without having the opportunity to go into a lot of ontological and all sorts of other logical arguments this morning. I'm going to give you three simple reasons why I believe in God. Here's the first. Simply because he's made an amazing world. I mean, my, my senses explore what God has made. The Bible says that uh, the heavens declare the glory of God. I mean, the earth is a majestic and amazing place. I look at the sheer magnitude of what he has created. And sometimes when I get a little blue, I go back to Isaiah, which tells me to, hey, just chill out. Step back a little bit. Look heavenward. And look at the magnitude of what he's created in all of the heavens. And then I begin to search online and and it begins to tell me the greatness. And I tell you, my heart begins to, well, I begin to, instead of looking at my small problems, look at the greatness of my God. The magnitude of what he's created, but also the complexity of what he's created. He may have created like trillions of stars, but I read from a NASA website just last week that if you take one cubic inch, okay, an inch, one cubic inch of water, there are 120 times more molecules in one square inch of water than there are stars in the entire observable universe. You got that? Like, I mean, really think about it. The magnitude of the earth, the complexity of what God created, and then the stunning beauty of it, besides, you know, if you're, uh, if you're a, a mathematician or you are a tendency to be, you know, systematically thinking, you might be able to create things that are logical, but he's created things that are beautiful. I mean, breathtaking. And then lastly, the actual order and precision with which things work. <laughs> the symmetry, the, the order is amazing. That's the first reason that I believe in God. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20 says this, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. What is made is clear. Here's the second reason I believe in God. I believe in God, secondly, because deep within the human heart is a little thing that is called conscience. It's the voice of God. I can tell you, when some of you, you can be with me here. Before I was ever taught certain things by my parents, I knew they were wrong. <laughs> and now you watch, then from there you watch your own kids, you watch your own grandchildren. You know, even before you had to tell them that certain things were wrong, you know, you can see them sort of. Yeah, because deep within the heart of every individual from a young age is the thing called conscience. That's the voice of God that he created within us. In Romans chapter 2 and verse 14 it says, So some people naturally obey the Lord's commandments, even though they don't have the law. This proves that the conscience is like a law written in the human heart. Okay, that's the second reason. First, because of the amazing world he's created. Secondly, the voice of conscience. And here's the last thing that I want you to mention this morning regarding why I believe. The main reason I believe is because something absolutely amazing was done by my God 2,000 years ago. 
He chose to humble himself and take on the form of a child and grow and live with humanity for 30 plus years. And we saw in him the divine attributes, omniscience, knowing all things. He was able to know people's thoughts without them ever speaking a word. He was able to take him with his own hands, create things that did not exist. He broke bread and he fed 5,000. He walked on water, defying the laws of nature. He proved that as he walked and he healed and did miracles, but the ultimate thing that he did was he rose from the dead, which no person has ever done. You can find the graves of every religious leader around the world, shrines where they were buried, but there is an empty grave Amen. where Jesus once lay. I believe he is the Son of God. In, in Colossians it says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And one other passage in that regard, this is powerful in Hebrews, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. He did that over centuries. But listen to this. But in the last days, he has spoken to us by his son, who be appointed heir over all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being sustaining all things by his powerful word after he had pure after he had provided purification for sins he sat down at the right hand of the majesty of god that is why i believe in god i believe because of the scope and beauty of his creation because within me he has actually the Bible says we're created in the image of. That is, there's parts of us that reflect the character of God. And part of that is our conscience. And, and lastly, I believe because he walked among men. When he walked among men, he told a story. We shared it last week here. We call it the story of the prodigal son. And it's a moving story, but it has a bearing on where we're at this morning too. Because that prodigal son was very sensually oriented, okay? All he could see was his temporal world. He was consumed with it. You know, it was alluring to him. And so he, in Jesus' story, he went and asked for his inheritance. And he went out and he was determined to enjoy everything that the senses offered. And indeed he did. I mean, he did and experienced everything that he could possibly experience. But like so much of our generation, at the conclusion of all of his experiences, he was left ultimately empty. And as he was empty and so dissatisfied, in Luke chapter 15 and verse 17 it says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. Sometimes God can't help us until we come to our senses and realize actually how hungry we really are. But when he, quote, came to his senses, he said, like, I've been pursuing all these things and here I am left destitute and empty. It's time to turn my attention back towards my father's house. And, and so he did. And what we discovered in the story is that when he returned, he found a father not who was scolding and holding him at a distance and said, what on earth have you done with your life? It's a beautiful thing. No matter how empty you feel or what a mess you may feel that you've made of your life, that's what Jesus came for, was to take people with broken and messy lives like mine and yours was. And he takes... And he restores us. 
He takes us after all of our wandering and all of our trying to fill our lives with what we thought was meaningful, and yet it left us empty. When I think about that emptiness, I, when I was a young person, I heard a poem that was entitled, The Touch of a Master's Hand. And it impacted me so much at the age of 17 or 18 that I actually went and wrote it down on a large piece of Bristol board. And I went, and as I was uh, packing up my parents' house for the move to Bridgewater back oh, within the last uh, year or so, here I found in a dusty old place this poem that I had written out, The Touch of the Master's Hand. And, um, and that particular poem talks about a violin. An old violin that had been discarded, sort of laid in an attic, and it was dusty, and it was worn, and it was broken, and it seemed useless, but it ended up in an auction. And the poem goes like this. It says, "'Twas battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it hardly worth his while to waste his time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I bidding, good folks? He cried. Who'll start the bidding for me? Well, it goes on. A dollar? Time for a dollar start. Dollar am I? A dollar, a dollar, then two, only two? Two dollars will make it three. Three dollars once. Three dollars twice. Going for three. But no. From the room far back, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening the loosened strings, he played a melody pure and sweet as a caroling angel sings. The music ceased. The auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, what am I bid for the old violin? And he held it up with the bow. A thousand dollars? And who'll make it two? Two thousand and who'll make it three? 3,000 once, 3,000 twice, and going and gone, said he. The people cheered. Some of them cried. We don't quite understand. What changed its worth? Swift came the reply. The touch of the master's hand. And many a life, out of tune, and battered and scarred with sin. Is auctioned cheap to a thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin. Mess of pottage, glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once, he's going twice, he's going almost gone. Ah, but the master comes, and the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that's wrought by the touch of the master's hand. He takes and does what no one else can do. I want to stop and I want to pray for you. We're going to conclude in just a moment in a song, but I want to pray for you wherever you are this morning. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you that you are who you said that you are. You said that those who come to you must believe that you are and that you're a rewarder of those who diligently seek you. So I pray for all of those who may be on a journey this morning. Perhaps uh, in their view, God doesn't exist. But what they've heard this morning has triggered something within their own spirit. I pray that this week would be a week of exploring and searching because, Lord, you said that uh, if we do search for you, that we will find you. So, Lord, I thank you that you can take lies no matter how out of tune they may seem. 
how broken. And Lord, your touch can make an amazing difference. I thank you, Lord, for the difference you've made in my life and the lives of so many. And may you make a difference in many other lives today. In Jesus' name, 